In this video, I will continue my discussion on the 2023 WASP physics practical. Specifically, I will be talking about the optics part of the experiment. And my focus today will be on the theory behind the possible experiment you are going to come across. So let's start off with the apparatus that schools were asked to provide. You will be expected to see a rectangular block prism. Good size is at least 10 cm by 9 cm. You'll be expected to see a drawing sheet, drawing board, four optical pins, four drawing pins, triangular prism, half metal rule, and a play mirror. I'm going to talk about two most likely experiments that could be constructed from this experiment. So you could possibly see these two possible experiments I'm going to talk about. The first is an experiment involving a rectangular block prism with a play mirror. The second is a triangular prism with a plane mirror. So I'm going to talk about these two experiments and explore the theory behind them and also the experimental procedure. I believe these are the two most likely ex uh, uh, procedures that could be formulated given this character. So let's take a look at the first possible experiment. This is the experimental setup of the first possible experimental procedure that we have set given the apparatus. So I'm going to talk more about this using the Marvin of Physics Lab just to give you an idea of how it looks. So first, let me just show you how a, rect uh, a rectangular block prism looks like and the the way, it's, the way light passes through it. So let's take a look. So I'm going to go to the apparatus section of this physics lab. Then I'm going to select the rectangular prism. So this is how it looks like. So this is the shape of the rectangular block prism. And uh, in this case, we, the length, which is 10 centimeter, is about is this length. Then we, I refer to this as the width, which is about 9 centimeter. Now let's explore how light passes through a rectangular prism. The angle of incidence refers to the angle between this red line and this 90 degree, right? So if you increase the angle of incidence, you see how light rays, the red line is light ray uh, going through the block prism. So this is basically how light goes through a rectangular block prism. But this time around, we are going to have a mirror, which means the light won't be able to go through. So let's take a look at how that setup looks like. So I'm going to check this other experiment. Then you have experiment eight on the optics. So this is the experimental setup. So under this experimental setup, you have your rectangular block pre, uh, uh, block prism. Then you have the mirror right here. Line A B represents the plane mirror. Then you have your light going from R O one, then hitting the mirror at point Q. Then reflected, so there's a refraction at this point O1. Then you have a reflection at point Q. Then the light refracts out of the glass at point O2. So this is the experimental setup that that relates to this particular set of apparatus. So my goal in this particular uh as a video is to show you the the the, make the procedure and also walk you through this, the theory behind this and also show you how the graph is going to look like so let's go back to our slide let's go through the experimental procedure so the first thing you do is so let's say this is the rectangular block prism so what you do is you mark you draw a perpendicular line here a perpendicular line will be at nine degrees to this prism then let's call this n1 the next thing you do is to measure your incident angle i so let's call this i then you place two pins here then what you do is to position your plane mirror here so you have your plane mirror right at the back here so this is a b right so the next thing you do is to trace the light ray going through these two pins. And to do that, you position your eye around here. 
So at some point, you'll see that you'll be able to, this is how the light, the, the light will we, we go through. So there'll be a ref, refraction here. Then a refraction, the refracted ray hits this at point Q. Then it reflects at that point. Then it hits this. Then after hitting this, it then refracts away like this. So what this means is you position your eyes somewhere here. You position your eyes somewhere here. And you try to trace these two pins. So once you trace those two pins, you'll be able to you, you, you trace those two pins by ensuring that this pin you place here completely obstructs these two pins, right? Then you place another pin that obstructs these two pins. So by the time you've got two into position, you draw a line joining these two points that you've gotten until you hit this point on the glass prism. Then this becomes your end two. So this line just shows you how the outline trace will, will, flow, will pass through these two appears. So now this is how they, this is what the experimental setup looks like. So what are the things you are going to measure? So you are going to measure the following. So this is going to be theta. You are going to measure this theta. Then you are going to measure this E. That is the angle of uh, emergence. Then you are going to measure the distance between N1 and N2. And you mark it as D. So this is how your table of rays is going to look like. So here will be the value of the incidence, the angle of incidence. So let's say this happens to be 20, for instance. Then you measure the following. You measure theta. You measure E. You measure B. You measure M, which is equal to sine. Then you measure another value known as A, which is equal to cos theta over 2. So the things you're going to have M here and you're going to have N here. So these are the things you are going to measure. So once you've gotten this out, you've measured all this. The next thing you'll be asked to do is to plot a graph of M on the Y axis and N on the X axis. So that this constitutes the procedure of this experiment. So what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to use the simulator to show you how the experiment goes. Then I also show you I also show you the relationship or prove the relationship between M and N. So let's take a look at how the simulation goes. So here is a simulation of how the experiment goes. So here you have the two pins P1, P2. Then you use, so this is how you go about, you set the angle of incidence. So the angle of incidence could be changed this way. Of course, you are not going to use a simulator, but I'm just using this to demonstrate that you can, you, you'll be able to change the angle of incidence. And once you change that, then you go to, you move your eye to whatever level, to whatever position that until you get to a point where you are seeing these two pins lined, lining up, right? So once you see that your eye level lines up with the two pins, that's P1 and P2, you simply, you stop. And once you stop, you take measurement. So measurement, you measure the theta, which is this angle at Q. Then you measure the emergence angle. Then you measure D, which is N, the distance between N1 and N2. Then you also expect to measure the width of the, um, of the rectangular block, which we know will be around nine centimeter, nine centimeter, because if this longer part is 10 centimeter, then this is nine. The value may, may differ if your rectangular block prism is not 10 by nine. So you are meant to take note of this width. We'll come back to what the width is meant for. The goal of this experiment is to direct you towards figuring out the refractive index of this block prism. 
and to do that with this experimental setup you will need to know the value of the width so i'm going to show you how that ties up how everything ties up so let's take a look at the reading so if you check the reading you'll see that you are too very high let's say from 10 to 50 then determine the value of d theta e m and n to calculate n you just take the sign of e and to calculate n you compute d times cos theta over so that's half of this theta take the cos multiply by d so that's how you calculate n so let's go back to this slide let's prove or show how m is related to n one thing you should understand is for every experiment where you need to draw is a straight line there must be a linear relationship between those two variables you want to plot so let's show how m and n are linearly related so let me show you how m and n are related so let's start off with this we know that first we've got a refraction taking place here so let's say this is angle of incidence i then we know that at this point we have a refraction taking place here so let's call this let's say r1 right so we know that the relationship between these two is as follows from snail's law we know that the refractive index of a glass with respect to air that is if we if the light rays move from air to glass the refractive index is the sign of the incident angle divided by sine of the angle of refraction so we know that this is the relationship then let's define other things then we know that the next event is we have the following from this point after the refraction the light ray hits the glass prism at this point q where we have a reflection because of the mirror so there's going to be a reflection because of the mirror so if you check this out you will see that the, the angle of, in, of reflection is going to be equal to the incident ray here at this point of reflection will be equal to the reflection the angle of reflection based on the principle of uh, the laws of reflection so if this is r1 then this will also be r1 because these two angles are alternating since these lines are parallel so this is going to be r1 as well so it means theta will be 2 r1 basically or r1 is theta over 2. okay so the next thing is once we've got a reflection taking place here there's going to hit this point and another refraction is going to take place so you can see that this is r1 as well because these two angles are alternating and then you have e at this point so e is the emergence angle if you notice you'll see that if you want to compute the angle of refraction a to be the angle of refraction if you are moving from glass to air and that will be equal to sine r1 over sine e you can easily deduce that this from cell law the refractive index from a to g is equal to one over refractive index from g to a we can easily deduce that sine e is equal to sine i and if that's the case means e is equal to i basically okay so we've established that e is equal to i and uh, we've also established that r1 is equal to theta over 2. so let's tie up all of this so we're going to take a look at this other shape within this rectangle so if you check out the shape where you have q o1 and O2, then you see there's a, there's a divider here, that's a, a perpendicular line here. 
then we know this is theta over 2, right? Then this is W. So this height is W. That's the width of the rectangular prism. You can easily tell that from trigonometry that tan theta over 2 has this angle is equal to this opposite. So this opposite is D divided by 2. If you check this out, you see that from here, we've measured this to be D, right? So this is half of D. So this is D over 2, this part. So it's be D over 2 divided by the height, which is W. So which can be written as D over 2 W. Then we also know that tan theta over 2 is equal to sine theta over 2 divided by cos theta over 2. So what this means is tan, tan theta is basically sine theta over cos theta. So in this case, we now have, so what we need to do now is to substitute tan theta as d over 2w equals sine theta over 2 divided by cos theta over 2. Now we know that theta over 2 is equal to r. So let's re replace that just in this case. So we have d over 2w equals sine r divided by cos theta over 2. So let's try to make find r the subject of the formula here. So if you do that, we're going to get sine r is equal to d cos theta over 2 divided by 2w. Now we know that the angle of the refractive index from air to glass is equal to sine r divided by is equal to sine i rather divided by sine r. So this means if you make sine i the subject, sine i will be equal to the refractive index from air to gas to glass times sine r. Then if you substitute the value of sine r, we are going to get the refractive index times d cos theta over 2 divided by 2w. So all we did was just to replace this one by this. So now we are going to have the following. So let me move to the next page. We are going to have sine i equal to the refractive index from air to glass times cos theta over 2 divided by 2 w, right? Then we know that i is equal to e. So we can equally say sine e is equal to the refractive index d cos theta over 2 divided by 2 w. So this is so this is the relationship. So we know that m is sine e, and we know that n is is d cos theta over 2. So this means we can simply say n equals the refractive index, the refractive index times the value of n divided by 2 w. We can easily deduce that a slope will definitely be this section, which is the refractive index divided by 2 w. Then we can compute the refractive index from given the slope by saying 2 w times s. So this is how you will be led or you can be led to figuring out the value of the refractive index from this experiment. So it means your graph is going to be like this. Since there's no y, the y-intercept is zero. It's going to start from zero and the slope, which is s, will be equal to the refractive index divided by 2w. So where w is the width of the glass, the rectangular glass prism. So this is how the n and 
and are related mathematically. So this summarizes the procedure for this particular experiment. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you the other experiment, but I, I strongly feel this is going to be the experimental. Uh, this is going to be the one you might come across because why provide more specific dimension like they specify that the dimension should be 10 by 9 so which which means that they are much more particular about the rectangular block prism but let's take a look at that of the triangular prism just in case that's the one you come across so this is the experimental setup of the second possible experiment you are going to come across so you also have a glass you have, you have a, a triangular block prism with a plane mirror right so the plane mirror is on this side which is on side a b so but before i go into this uh, let me show you how the the way light passes through a triangular prism so that you have an idea of how light flows straight triangular block prism is a bit more complex because it could it could experience what they call total internal reflection that's the way you set the angle of incidence the light ray could bounce back. But the interesting thing about the experiment is we have a plane mirror. And with a plane mirror, it means it's guaranteed that there will be a reflection along side AB. But let's take a look at how light goes through an ordinary triangular prism. So here you have a triangular block prism. You can see that as we increase the with a small angle of incidence, you have total internal reflection. Then as you increase the angle of incidence, eventually the light breaks out of the triangular prism. So this is how light goes through a triangular block prism. It's quite interesting. It experiences total internal reflection, even without the play mirror. But once you have a play mirror, you are going to experience internal reflection, irrespective of the angle of incidence. So let's take a look at how this experiment goes. I'm going to use the Marvin of Physics Lab to simulate how the experiment goes. So the first thing you do is to position, uh, is to measure out your angle of incidence here. Then you line up two pins, P P1 and P2. Then the next thing you do is you look through this line CB. You try to look through this side of the triangular prism to see if you can trace these two pins. So to trace it, you just look through with another pin and once you can you can position a pin that blocks both p1 and p2 you stop on this simulation environment the easy the way i get to know if when to stop is by looking at this top region where where i have the two pins so once they line up perfectly it means that i can stop at that point and take readings so now this is the point where you have to stop basically then the next thing you want to do is to measure the two angles. So you measure the angle of emergence, the angle of emergence here, that's at point uh, O. Then you measure the angle at point C, that's the angle at point Z. And once you have those two values, you record them. So, so here, here's how it goes. You measure, you set I at 25, that's the angle of incidence. Then you measure the value of D, then you measure the value of E and you repeat that for various value, values of I. So it's, it's quite straightforward. So I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to show you the equation governing this experiment. And uh, although I'm not going to go through a rigorous proof, I'll just show you the equation behind this experiment. So I have an idea of the relationship between D and E. Then what will be the nature of the graph? So I will talk about it. So let's take a look. Just to recap, in this experiment, you will be asked to set the value of i. So let's say the value of i is 10 or 20, right? The next thing you do is to measure the value of d. So d is this angle at point c. So what, ha what I'm going to do is after figuring out point p and e, you draw a line connecting that uh, point P and E to this point O. Now, once you've done that, the next thing you do is to extend, you stretch this out, then you stretch this out. So, once you stretch this P1, P2 line, and you stretch this P3, P4 line, they, they are going to meet at point Z, Z 
And this is the point where you measure the angle D. Then you also measure this emergence angle E. So you measure D, you measure E, and that's it. So what about the graph? So the graph would be a graph of E on the y-axis, x-axis. So the question in your mind is, how are they related? What equation connects these two values? I'm not going to go through a rigorous proof because the proof is really complicated. If you want me to provide a rigorous mathematical proof as to how E and D are related, leave a comment in the comment section and I'm going to go about doing that once I see a lot of people are interested in it. Let me show you the equation between E and D. So here's the equation. E is equal to minus 0.5D plus A. So here's the equation where A is the angle at point A or the rectangular on the triangular prism. Since most triangular prisms are a equilateral triangle in nature, in terms of the, the, the surface that light goes through, it means A is 60 degrees. So we can safely say that E is equal to minus 0.5B plus A. So in this case, the slope, you should expect the slope to be minus 0.5 and the y intercept to be 60. So the graph will look something like this. So since E is on the y axis and D is on the x axis and the slope is negative, it means you're going to have something like this. So you're going to have this kind of slope, this kind of line. And it cuts across the y axis at point 60. And the slope S is minus 0 0.5. So, this is how you should expect your graph to be if this is the experimental procedure. So, let's talk about the precautions to be taken in general. So, yeah, yeah, five precautions you should take. Ensure the four pins are all lined up in a straight line for taking readings. Then ensure you avoid error to parallax whenever you are reading from meter rule or protractor. Then ensure the optical pins are placed vertically without bending. That is when you are tracing the pins. Ensure they are placed vertically so that you get a good trace. Then ensure the optical pins are reasonably spaced. So the spacing between P1 and P2 and P3 and P4 should be reasonably spaced. Then ensure that the traces are neat to ensure accurate measurement. But these are the general, the general precautions you carry out when performing this experiment. So in, a, in our next video, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to simulate that of the rectangular uh, a prism. I'm going to show you how to carry that out step by step, including plotting the graph using the Magnum of Physics Lab.